Welcome to The Other Discovery Show, the podcast that's not about podcasts. It's the bonus show from the Podcast Discovery Show, and it's about all the other things we've discovered throughout the week. I'm Kirk. And I am Zach. And I discovered something that's kind of interesting, and I'm pretty tempted to do it. I found something called Tab for a Cause. And what they do is you can install a essentially plugin for your web browser Mm -hmm. that makes it so when you open a new tab it has a lot of stuff on there like it'll have like a calendar or you can like save tasks on it and things like that but each time one of those is opened there's also a small advertisement on it and they do that specifically for raising money for charity so the Mm -hmm. ad money is directly given to charity and the the company has essentially been very transparent with this all of their code for the the new tab, the browser extension, and the website are all open source, and they publish quarterly financial reports so you can see how they're using the money. That's but cool. at the very top of this, they literally have just, it's going up all the time. You can just see, like, it's almost like a, a clock. The, the cents column is going up, but they've already raised a million dollars for charity from just people opening their tabs. Really? So, and, like, companies will pay for their... Uh, yeah, com- to be companies on that will platform. pay to advertise you, and that money that they're making off advertising, they uh, donate to charity as well. Huh. And so, essentially, you, uh, I guess, when you set up an account, what you do is you go through and you choose the like your favorite charity that you like to donate to. Mm. So the I options they have that. here, that's cool. Yeah, the options they have here are like feed feed children, build libraries, send emergency aid. So there's a lot of like cool stuff that you can do literally just by whenever you open the 400 tabs that we all have open at any given time, you're (laughs) making money for charity. And no, and I also read a little bit uh, because whenever you see this, it's like, okay, so what's the privacy policy like on this thing? Yeah. Um, But honestly, they're, they're pretty transparent about the whole thing. They, uh, they really try to just make it so that you know what, what they're doing. And it's not something where you have to guess. And you can, I think there is literally a setting in the U.S. at least where you can say you're not allowed to sell my data to third party. So, okay, a lot of times how they'll use your data is marketing companies or any brands will use the cookies that you have in your browser to try and give you specific advertisements. So for Kirk, it would be like Beanie Babies and Mm -hmm. Foot Lotions and Onesies. And so essentially... He would only get ads for those things unless he cleared his cookies or stopped searching for it altogether. Foot or baby lotions. <laughs> <laughs> or if he or if he suggested to this company, look, I don't really want specific ads. Just give me whatever ad. And then luckily for him, his tastes are so <laughs> random <laughs> that How he did might I still get, get the same ones. <laughs> what? But yeah, they also have they also have a, a web like a search function as well where you can do the same thing where uh, advertisers will pay to be on that service and you can raise money for charity. That's fascinating. We're all using tabs. So definitely going to look into that. What beanie babies? Yes. The, the beanie baby foot lotion. Uh, that's, that's what I'll be looking into right. After no, there was the a comma there. It's beanie babies and foot lotion. Oh, okay. That makes more sense. Not foot lotion for your beanie babies. <laughs> that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's <what> I've been <laughs> looking for. <laughs> God, this is so stupid. I don't have any Beanie Babies at all. Yeah, he's this just is planning a new his one. collection. This no, is a new one that you got me on. Is he's <laughs> planning his collection. It's my Beanie Baby obsession that I apparently have. Um, so in research for this episode's PDS, we learned a lot about one dude. And they just kind of scratched the surface on the episode about him. We were talking about this, you know, biodome type scenario that they had going on created by this guy named John P. Allen. Um, And I wanted to look into him because he sounded fascinating. And I pulled up his Wikipedia and it's a freaking Bible. The thing is huge. And he like, I don't know how he lived long enough to do all the things because he did so many things. So I'm just going to like 
shotgun some of these and then it'll give more it'll give a lot more context to the dude we're talking about when you listen to the the pds and and this is a guy that founded you know all of these crazy experiments that went on at the what was it called the biosphere, biosphere two. two yeah a 250 million dollar like closed ecosystem he built in the desert in arizona it's crazy it's crazy so john allen uh is a systems ecologist, engineer, metallurgist, adventurer, and writer. He owns a, a thousand. This, there's some things that won't even sound like they. This is the same guy because they don't really go together. It's just like what? This one I just put in here because it's just so random. He owns a thousand acre mahogany tree farm in Puerto Rico. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he was a co-producer and dramaturge of Theater of All Possibilities, an internationally touring theater company that has over two dozen publications to its credit, many under his nom de plume, Johnny Dolphin. Johnny Dolphin. <laughs> that sounds like a different that sounds like a different thing. It sounds is like there, a, is there like a nom de porn? <laughs> that's what it sounds like. Remember when we did that that nom show? Nom stripper. Uh, what was it? My dad wrote a porno. What was that dude's Oh, what was his pen name? I can't remember. It was Rocky something. Flintstone or something like it that. Was something, was it? it was something ridiculous <laughs> like that. It was so stupid. That show anyway, was that, funny, that's man. A, that was a great show. By the way, if you have not listened to the first like season of My Dad Wrote a Porno, you should. It Do is yourself hilarious. a favor and just go laugh. You will giggle and you won't I'm trying, regret I'm it. trying to remember the setup. We, I know we normally don't talk about podcasts, but it is a funny one. Like, I think the setup is a son finds out his dad's an erotic writer and reads it. He reads it live on, with yeah, other comedian friends on the on the show. And his dad's like in his like seventies. <laughs> He's actively writing. Rocky Flintstone. That was Rocky his name. Flintstone. <laughs> I'm almost positive. Uh, <laughs> it sounds it sounds right. <laughs> it's, it was it's such a funny show, um, and the erotica is so bad. But yeah, Johnny Dolphin's pretty good too. Yeah, Johnny Dolphin. I def- that yeah. I could see him writing that too. <laughs> he was a fellow at Linnean Society, the Royal Geographical Society, and the Explorers Club. And he's been called a swashbuckling frontiersman and an eccentric mix of scientist, artist, entrepreneur, and adventurer. Alan became a senior metallurgist. That's a hard thing to say. How would you say that, Zach? I think that's it. I think you got it. Metallurgist for the Algahaney Ludlam Steel Corporation, where he headed a metals team that developed over 30 different alloys to product status. In 1963, Allen self financed a two year sojourn around the globe by land and sea to study the origins of indigenous cultures and their various approaches to living within their ecosystems. So I think this is probably where he got the bug for building ecosystems. Yeah, I think this was the, the start of it, the setup. But I gotta read this crazy event. This, this, this I would do in a heartbeat. This trip that he made. It sounds amazing. Okay, his journey took him to Africa, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Turkey, India, Nepal, Burma, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, Australia, Japan, and the Philippines. He mixed with Ber- Berbers and the avant-garde literary kutch. There's so many words that I don't know how to say. Uh, that of the Tangiers set up a painting studio in Morocco, hitchhiked across North Africa uh, from Tangiers to the pyramids and Karnak, lived with tribal chiefs in Sudan, traveled with refugees to the Ron of Kutch in India and Pakistan, consulted for the International Medical Relief Organization in Vietnam, lived on a junk with tankas, Hong Kong boat people is what it says because I guess so. That's a name. This is what I'm saying. There, there are things a, I don't even, yeah, I've never even heard it's of. Some specific culture, I guess. Yeah, and worked as a journalistic stringer to a foreign correspondent on the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Southeast Asia, uh, visiting 23 South Vietnamese provinces in a six month period. This how, how did this is the same dude? I mean, I was wondering how you get like because honestly. I want to have written about me. That was a swashbuckling frontiersman. (laughs) That is such an awesome thing to be called. And I was like, what do you have to do to be called that? And apparently it's that. Like, just go all over the place. And then in 1969, he co-founded and became general manager of 
Synergia Ranch. And that's kind of where everything, where he started this whole like compound, uh, not compound, uh, commune Commune. lifestyle. Uh, I mean, eventually it was a compound. (laughs) I would would almost call the biosphere to a compound. It's a beautiful one, but it's, it was definitely a compound for those that were in there. I feel Uh, like compound definitely has a connotation. Yeah, maybe it does. In the 1980s, he started Biosphere 2, a quarter billion dollar project financed by an oil tycoon that was primarily created for the purpose of scientific discovery, as well as a prototype for habitats in non-hospitable environments. The biosphere had a rainforest, savanna, desert, marsh, ocean, and agriculture biome. Eight participants were locked in the biosphere for two years, where they had to self-sustain and maintain the ecosystems. They were successful to an extent, but not without much drama and many hurdles. Uh, And I want to end with this quote by him. And it's just, it's perfect. I think adventure is where human beings can find the best route to the answer of the question, who am I? You don't have to justify climbing Mount Everest. You don't have to justify diving deeper into the ocean than anyone before. And you don't have to justify going into space. It's an end in itself because it leads to contemplation. It makes you out of... It takes you out of superstition and fanaticism. That may be its greatest benefit. (laughs) So basically, you know, he just, he had this like adventurous spirit. Um, He sounded like a crazy dude. He doesn't seem like a, an amazing guy, at least in the, in the story from the biosphere too, but this dude's history and his Wikipedia is crazy. And all the things that he did. People that are this intense in their life are intense to be around. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. That, it's just what it is. It, it's what it is. Like there's a reason that Steve Jobs and like Bill Gates were as intense as they were and created the reputation they had of being ruthless is because they were nonstop going for it, you know? And so nonstop. that's why they don't have, they don't have an off switch. And that includes like, they're not always nice people to be around. So yeah, that's, but that is, that is wild. And you know what? I think it's time to go something else wild. Um, we we got a couple calls oh, geez. on on the the disco hotline, and I think it's time to uh, to hear from a couple of uh, friends of ours. Here we go. Say yeah, say yeah, say yes to the PD. Say yeah, say yeah, say yes to the PD. Say yes, say yes, say yes to the PD. Hey guys, um, oh my goodness, it's, it's been a minute. It's like the minutes turn into hours, and the hours turn into days, and the days turn into weeks, and then the weeks turn into months, and it's just been such a long time. I'm so sorry. I really like you guys. I just want to let you know I'm still here, and I, um, I, I've been listening every week. I haven't missed a single episode. Um, I've just been so busy with all the cats. Do so you remember those, right? Like those, the kitty cats that I have to um, give back to and all that. And then my mom, oh my goodness. Oh, my mom is, ah, she's ridiculous. So I'm really sorry. I've just been real busy, but I love you, uh, especially Zach. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and first of all, I don't know why. But Google translated this because this goes to our voicemail um, and they, it translated this into Portuguese. This is, is a what, new game, right? This is like, what did Google translate this to now? Uh, I mean, do you want to know what it, what it says in Google yes, Translate? Yes, please read the whole thing for me. I mean, first of all, the, the say yes to the PDS part is just like say ya say, say ya say. But then it says, I would ask you to see ya. I believe you would go. Nina, you didn't answer me. I was attacked before you, but if you're going to fall here, you'll see me all over there. I think you've gone to your house. Wait, so did you just Google translate that from Portuguese? Yeah, to English. Because it, it was in Portuguese. I remember that. I didn't. I, I didn't. I, it's not what he said. It's not what he said. It's I just thought it was no. interesting and just wanted no. to share it. She just wanted to share it with everybody. <laughs> That's great. And yeah, everybody, a great song. It's everybody a great song. who uh, hadn't heard it before, that is the unofficial PDS theme song that he <laughs> created for us long, long ago. Yep. Yep. But we also caught a, we got a call from Johnny that we need to, uh, oh, geez, and, and, Johnny. and Johnny has a PSA this time that he it needs is, to share with the world. It's an interesting PSA. 
Hey, boys, it's your favorite friend, Johnny. Hey, how you doing? Hey, I hope you guys had a great Thanksgiving, a good old turkey day. I know for me, I took a one-way ticket to Turkey Town, and then I did a little gobble until I wobble. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, but listen, hey, uh, it's on a serious note. Uh, discovery I made this week is that COVID is going crazy. Everybody got the Rona, Ona, Rona, Ro, COVID, Corona, whatever you want to call it. Listen, here's I got some advice for you all, okay? You either got to mask it or cast it. You know what I'm saying? All right? It's important. It's a PSA from Johnny, Johnny PSA of the week. You know what I mean? So you got to mask it or you cast it, man. That's all I'm saying right there. All right. Talk to you guys later. Have a good one. So you heard it here. The newest message from the, what is it? It's not the FDA. What's the? The World Health Organization. <laughs> sure. World Health Organization. Mask it or casket. Mask it or casket. And that's, I guess that's, that's the options. So thanks. This sounds thanks like for the worst in, t-shirt ever. <laughs> yeah. It's a little morbid for uh, like an organization like them to be putting out, but it is what it is. You know, it gets, it's like across. a click it or ticket, you know? Yeah. You buckle Mask up or, it or you don't get a casket. T- <laughs> It sounds more like a billboard than a t-shirt. There we go. It does. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's fair. Um, but yeah, so thanks so much for calling in. We uh, we appreciate it. And yeah, if anybody else would like to call into the Disco Hotline, please do. We would love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your discoveries. We'd love for you to just say whatever, you know, come, come hang out and be on the show. The number is 813-708-9118. Awesome. Thank you guys for those calls. Always, it's always a joy. I always get excited when I see them. I'm like, oh God, here we go. What we got now? Uh, it's always fun. Um, I found an article about Russian spies. And we've talked about, you know, spy tactics in the past. Uh, and this is a fairly old article now, but it's talking about how many Russian spies are in the U S during this time. And it's by far more than what was ever here during the cold war. Hmm. Uh, and it's, it's a fascinating read. Um, and also it talks a little bit about, uh, some of the ways that they would train for becoming a spy in the U S like someone that's going to infiltrate, uh, you know, regular society and things like that. So it says, America is infested with more Russian spies than at any point in history, says former intelligence agency agents who spoke with – this is from the New York Post. Um, that I would say there are a few thousand here, uh, said Boris – I can't say his last name. I'm very good. Uh, he's a former double agent who worked for the CIA spying on the KGB uh, from the 70s into the 80s. It says that's because each mole is a long shot and the Russians want to maximize their odds out of a thousand spies. One or two will perform, will get X and get access to some sort of secret or something like that. The current atmosphere in the U S is we're having a love affair with Russia that the cold, now that the cold war is over. Um, However, but there are more Russian spies here now that the cold war is actually gone. Uh, But the thing that I found most fascinating is in South Russia is where they have a lot of these training camps, but apparently like they're very hidden. You can't see them like they're not even like on satellite maps or anything like that. Um, but they've basically made these whole towns just like American small towns so that they can train. So like the Soviet Union had a number of schools that trained beautiful women to, and this is uh, part of it, um, uh, Basically, they were uh, women spies to take advantage of dudes because they were pretty. Uh, They were called worm on a hook agents. Some of these schools are located in small towns in the southern part of the country. None appear on a map. They are exact replicas of American suburbs where the bulk of the KGB agents were deployed during World War II. Russian spies in training in these towns buy groceries at 7-Eleven eat hamburgers at McDonald's, watch American TV and go to American movie theaters, get American newspapers that are delivered every morning and speak only English. Uh, I just found that fascinating. Hmm. They have this whole like training cities uh, where you will learn to be American and they, they try to like, I guess 
saturate you in the American culture so that it becomes a part of you and becomes second nature. Yeah. No, that's, that's crazy. I mean, I don't know how we can't see a Seven Eleven next to a McDonald's on a satellite in Russia. <laughs> I feel like that would stick out, but no, it is, it is pretty crazy that they're going through like that length of training where they're, they're really going for it and trying to make people just live every day as an American. And, and they're nobody about, gets like, a newspaper anymore. What are they trying to like get? Like what are they, what's, uh, and a lot of it they talk about is they're trying to get more info on specifically like military technology and even just regular technology because since the cold war they've been so far behind in technology that they're trying to get ahead of us and but same thing with like the the space race and all that crazy stuff um anyway i just I thought it was a fascinating article about these cities in russia that are just like us cities yeah i would that would be the weirdest thing cuz i'm sure they're great at it so like you could walk yeah. into this place and you wouldn't know if you were just dropped there that, uh, okay, there's a short story right there where somebody's just like living <laughs> in a town. They're like, what's happening? Why does everybody seem a little off? They're all Russian spies. I'd watch that. I'd watch that show. So me and Kirk the other day, were talking about the Michelin star. We were talking about essentially that that's a thing that if you have a Michelin star, on your restaurant, that means you're extremely fancy. And usually, it, well, not usually, I'm pretty sure they are still very, very respected, revered, everything for their choices and for their standard they've set. And so what we talked about was like, so we first heard about it and you're like, oh, well, it sounds like that tire company, but that's stupid. It can't be the it was tire like a, company. It was like a tweet that I saw. <laughs> it was like a meme almost. But. It is. It is the tire company. So the Michelin guides are a series of guidebooks published by the French tire company Michelin for more than a century. So over a hundred years they've been yes, doing this. Yes. Dang. So the term normally refers to the annually published Michelin Red Guide, the oldest European hotel and restaurant reference guide, which awards up to three Michelin stars for excellence to a select few establishments. The acquisition or loss of a star can have dramatic effects on the success of a restaurant. And it also publishes a series of guides to cities, regions, countries, and uh, it called the Green Guides. So this all started in 1900, and they essentially wanted to kind of give people a guide to get around and to understand how all like some of the best places they could visit in the in the place. But literally... 1900 is pre World War One. They they crazy. They've been around. Um, so essentially, during World War One, it was suspended uh, because there was a, a world war happening at the time. Makes sense. But then after the war, they picked right back up. Um, but then essentially, <laughs> in 1920. Uh, Michelin himself, while visiting a tire merchant, noticed copies of the guide being used to prop up a workbench Robert based on Michelin. the. Robert Michelin? Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. No, it's Andre. Oh. Based on the <laughs> based on the principle that man only truly respects what he pays for, he decided to charge a price for the guide, which is about two fifteen in 1922. So he essentially saw somebody mistreating it and decided to uh to charge for it so they wouldn't do that. But then you start to uh their star ranking started in 1936. And here's the the kind of the criteria they would use. Uh, one star is a very good restaurant in its category. Two stars is excellent cooking, worth a detour. Three stars, exceptional cuisine, worth a special journey. And literally today, this is still, if you have three Michelin stars, you are absolutely going to crush it as a restaurant. If you can do this, you are done. But one of the cool things is how they do their inspections. So, Michelin reviewers, commonly called inspectors, are anonymous. They do not identify themselves, and their meals and expenses are paid for by Michelin, never by a restaurant being reviewed. Michelin has gone to extraordinary lengths to maintain the anonymity of its inspectors. Many of the company's top executive lawyers have never met an, an inspector. Huh. Inspectors themselves are advised not to disclose their line of work, even to their parents, who might be tempted to boast about it. And in all the years that it has been putting out the guide, Michelin has refused to allow its inspectors to speak to journalists. 
The inspectors write reports that are distilled in annual STARS meetings at the, at the guide's various national offices into the ranking of two, three, or one star or no stars. So it's just crazy to me that like that it's okay, that so secretive. When a restaurant gets awarded a Michelin star, does the Michelin man come with like a giant check and say like, here's your star? Yes. Because that's what I would imagine. Yeah, it's like Bill Ingvall in a Michelin suit. And <laughs> here's says, your star. Here's your star. And then <laughs> that's all it takes. It's just that easy. But it is crazy that it's a stinking tire company. Like, I remember yeah. having that whole thought process myself. It was like, this has got to be a different Michelin, right? Like, it's got to be like Michelin Foods or, you know, special fancy Michelin place. And honestly, okay. Not tire, man. I... Fully appreciate and understand. Well, I don't fully appreciate it. I'm not cultured enough to have ever been to a, a Michelin starred restaurant, but I get what they're going for. They're going for that. Like uh, when you look at the pictures of who has it, like excellence and presentation, innovation, like they're going for that next level of a meal. But the one I've that's got a really- bucket list of restaurants I want to go to in my life. And they're usually Michelin star restaurants. Oh, are they? Yeah. I yeah. mean, they're, it's it's not that it's going to be like not good because it's so fancy. It's going to be good too, but it's extremely, extremely fancy. And I'm sure expensive for the most part, oh, but yeah. they have another thing called the Bib Gourmand, which since 1955, they've also highlighted restaurants offering exceptionally good food at moderate prices. Hmm. So what this is, is like the Michelin star of affordable food. And so you can go find that as well. So you can is go McDonald's find McDonald's on there. McDonald's is not on there. Dang. Be- because it tastes bad. <laughs> yeah, it does so bad. Taco Bell could be on there, though. I like Taco Bell. <laughs> I mean, whoever like invented all of... I've said this before. I'll say it again. Whoever invented all of the uh, flavorings for Taco Bell that makes soy taste like a taco should go work for like NASA. Like, Just get that person <laughs> in there to just make dirt taste like something. And they'll do it. They keep taking good things off the menu, though. They're like going to... They're ruining it. They're ruining it. Taco did, Bell do better. I did see they got rid of the beefy crunch burrito, and then they, I, they lost me because I love my Mexican pizza, and they just destroyed it. It's gone forever. No Mexican pizza anymore. Yeah, it was uh, sad. It was a tough. It was a tough year for everyone, including Taco Bell. Yeah. Yep. Beefy five layer burrito. Bye bye. Yep. No. Uh, no Michelin stars for Taco Bell anymore. They, they lost their mission. It was all based on the Mexican pizza. <laughs> all right. Uh, are we good? Are we done? Yeah, this should be like 20 <laughs> Are we done? <laughs> Can you leave that part in? See everybody. Are we done? Are we done? Can we be done? Are we over? Yeah, we're done. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs> we really appreciate it. We love you guys. Bye. No, I was asking because you had another one on here, so I didn't know if you wanted to do it or not. No. I mean, I can do it, but I think we're good. <laughs> we're, fine. we're We're right at the time. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> that was... Are we done? We nailed the ending of that. This was a podcast from the Podfix Network.